Okay, welcome everyone who's watching us on our live stream. Uh, we're here at the Building Center in London uh, with a live audience, and we've just watched Elevation, which is the documentary Dazeen made last year about drones and how they will change architecture, cities, and in fact, all of everything in the future. Uh, I'm joined here with Liam Young, who is one of the, the key interviewees in the movie. Uh, in fact, he was the first person we interviewed when we had the idea of making the movie, and it was definitely his comments that made us realize that we were onto a winner with this film. Um, I think particularly the, when you said the line that it could become as, as um, disruptive as the internet, which made us all sit up and take notice about what would happen with drones. Anyway, Liam and I are going to have a conversation about, um, about drones, about the Internet of Things, about surveillance, about transportation, and all those kind of things. We're going to ask whether we got our predictions right in the movie that came out a year ago. But Liam, first of all, introduce yourselves to everyone. Who are you, what do you do, and where did your kind of drone obsession come from? Uh, thanks, Marcus. Um, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Liam. I am, I guess, a speculative architect. What that means is that I don't design buildings, but instead I tell stories about the global, urban, or architectural implications of new technologies. Uh, so we make films um, uh, that really try and engage with some of the other kinds of futures that might be produced around the technologies that we talk about um, in dominant media narratives. So, Drones for us has been a real subject of interest across the last few years because as I mentioned in the film, we're at a really interesting point with drone technologies where they've just become democratized. And by that I mean they're just in now becoming accessible and in the hands of everybody. And as we see with most technologies, that's where really interesting things occur. That's when technologies get misused or reappropriated or used by the sorts of groups that, that aren't first adopters or aren't industry experts. And that's kind of this, where, where we are with drones right now. Um, so we've made a lot of work kind of pushing back on the dominant narratives around drones to explore the way they could be used and possible futures they might generate. So the, our movie came out a year ago, and in fact, we did the interview with you almost two years ago, actually. Um, how much have things changed since then? Are our predictions wildly inaccurate, or is it starting to, to come true? Yeah, I mean, in a way, um, I don't know. Right? The, the thing I love about films like this, uh, the thing I love about science fiction as well, is, is not so much judging these type of projects based on whether or not the predictions that we're talking about inside the films come true or not. It's, it's really the conversation they're generating around them in the moment. And in that sense, I think that the, the Dizine film was super interesting, that it connected a whole new audience to these conversations that people in the media art world were having around drones quite extensively. But if you were to draw me out on that, I guess um, we're seeing the beginnings of some of these things. I mean, a lot of those predictions weren't things that were supposed to happen on a one-year time cycle. Um, but we are seeing the imminent plausibility of um, Amazon delivery drones. Uh, and of course, the, the big drone headline from the last year has been the drone disruption. And we were talking a bit about the ways that drones are now in the hands of people that normally couldn't afford to have them. And that means that you know, a disgruntled passenger can use it to fly a drone over Stansted Airport if they want to. Um, so I think there we're seeing little glimpses of what can happen in an unregulated drone world. Because the, the narrative arc of our film is a bit, ends up, starts off optimistic and ends up dystopian. Uh, and then, of course, like you said, Gatwick Airport was shut down just before Christmas by, well, I don't think people are even sure whether there was actually a drone or not. It was all a bit weird, wasn't it? But yeah. it, the, the drone at that point became this kind of sinister cipher for, for bad stuff that can happen. And it was around the same time when people were talking about Russian hacking and surveillance and stuff like that. But it became, the drone became a metaphor for evil disruption. Yeah, or like, like technology out of control. You know, it's, it's a placeholder for all of our conversations about what happens when technology runs rampant yeah. um, without regulation. What incidents like that really do is bring into focus just how little we know and just how unprepared we are for what happens when these things are, are out in the wild. Um, 
in similar terms. Like, what does it mean um, now um, to, to really have no idea of what to do about drones, but to be able to walk down the street now and buy one for $200? Um, like, it, it, it's a great signal of how slow legislation is, how slow politics or culture changes around technologies. And this is a real manifest moment of that playing out in real time. And I think for us at Dazeen as well, like, it was, a, it was a, a really big moment because lots of things came together. In fact, the genesis of the idea of making a film about drones was I was with my kids and, and found that um, the, the toy shop there, the whole front half of the shop was drones. And of course, I bought my daughter one for her birthday and that was her flying her drone in the movie. Um, which, which we gave it to her for her birthday last summer, but she doesn't use it anymore. And um, now I'm sure the, the toy shop has moved on and is selling something else. And just like three years ago, they were selling 3D printers. And last year it was drones. Like, wh what are they selling now? Is there some kind of other tech that's um, become the, the hot topic? What we're doing now is just sticking AI in everything. You know, so now we're selling Amazon Alexas and Google Homes. You know, it's just a continuation of the same kind of model. And soon drones will come back around because we'll put an Amazon Alexa on a drone and now we'll have a flying Alexa um, that we can start to have conversations with. Um, so I still think they're there and what we're seeing happening with drones is they're becoming smaller and cheaper and higher resolution. We're seeing professional quality drones becoming totally ubiquitous. Uh, and that's really changing things. It's changing the way films like this can be made. Um, it's changing who makes them um, and it's changing our perspective and the way that we're starting to see the world because drone technologies, they're not new. You know, we, we first launched balloons with cameras on them in, in, in World War I and World War II, um, uh, but now everyone can do it. And I think that's the big change where, yeah, your daughter can do it. She can be so, it's so easy for her to do it that she becomes bored of it. Um, it doesn't make the conversation we need to have any less urgent um, because they're just gonna be more and more in the air. Drones have definitely changed the kind of physical nature of the world in one way because now if you go to, uh, we were, I was at, um, in Canada recently, we went to visit this famous waterfall and there's a sign there saying, no drones. And then you go to the, you know, the, the beautiful, some viewpoint on top of the mountain and it says, no drones. So there's, <laughs> there's a kind of infrastructure of, of, of people telling you that you can't use a drone here anymore. Yeah, and there's lots of lots of signs. Um, we were just at uh, Ayers Rock in Australia, and there's a bunch of no drone signs. And then you look above the sign, and there's a sky full of drones uh, of people flying them. Um, so we know where we don't want them, but we don't know yet how to not have them there. Um, uh, and that's what we saw happening in, around the airports. Um, and and really, the, the greatest shock that's come out of that for me is just how little we've seen of that since. Like when we first, I think we were talking just after it had happened as well, and I was imagining that everyone all over the world would go, oh, yeah, that, that, that sounds easy. And, and we'd see disruptions of airports all over you the world. You mean the, the Gatwick Airport? Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, but I can't imagine why, it's, it, it, I, I don't know why this doesn't happen every day, um, because it's just literally so easy. Um, uh, I'm sure it's going to happen again soon. Uh, I'm sure at a certain point a drone's going to crash into a jet and it's going to crash. I'm sure we're very f close to a, f a moment where one falls out of the sky and knocks someone on the head and kills them. Um, and we really don't know what that is going to mean. We, we, we don't know what, that, what to do. Um, like, who do you sue in that instance? Do you sue the, the pilot who it wasn't controlling it, they just had it on a predetermined path. Do you sue the coder who wrote the algorithm that, that's controlling the drone? Do you sue the drone company that, that, that made the drone that failed? Do you sue the battery manufacturer because it was the battery that failed? Um, or do you sue the person who charged the battery because they didn't charge it right? Um, we just don't know. Um, and that's one of the real urgencies of this conversation. Um, maybe we can broaden the conversation away from just drones, because you know, autonomy, for example, electric power, those, those are two key aspects in the future of transportation in its own right. I mean, what other aspects of the future are on your radar that may be interface with drones in some way? Yeah, I mean, in a way, uh, um, drones are just the really um, visible end of um, uh, a planetary scaled network. And that's really the technology that we're actually talking about. Drones as themselves are pretty dumb and stupid objects. 
but when you connect them to a network um, where they are able to locate themselves in space, um, know their own position, navigate, land safely, broadcast um, uh, video, then it becomes immensely powerful. Drones are just a way for us to remotely operate in the world, um, uh, and drones are manifestations of the capacity for the network that, that allows us to do so. Um, so if you think about what else can piggyback on that network, um, that's really the nature of future tech to come. Um, uh, driverless cars, obviously. Um, these are things that I think we should be having a very critical conversation about. Maybe that's the next uh, DZine film. Um, uh, because we're coming to a very similar moment like we were at with drones a couple of years ago where... Um, uh, you know, we're seeing you know, little glimmers of, of driverless situations in expensive Teslas and things like that. We're maybe a few years out from them being in every Uber we get into no longer has a driver um, or has a driver that's just a, a babysitter, you know, there for legal reasons. Um, yet we're not having the conversations that we need to be having about drones right now, about driverless cars right now. You know, we should have been having that conversation 10 years ago when Ford and all these other companies were investing billions of dollars in driverless cars, um, that tech is already coming um, because these companies are so deep in, um, no matter what we do, what, or what we figure out right now, oh, driverless cars are a really bad idea. It's not gonna put the genie back in the bottle. These things are coming. Um, so they're coming, we need to be talking about that. Um, thinking about the implications of drones in terms of some of the stuff we saw with um, uh, the conversation around uh, things like Amazon warehouses and the infrastructure of the city that, that was permanent and fixed systems is now going to be totally atomized. Um, warehouses are no longer going to be Amazon fulfillment centers on the edges of cities, but they're going to be just this cloud of objects drifting around us where we just dial up, you know, there's going to be a cloud of like um, da Vinci Code novels floating around the airport um, and we just call one up and it's going to drop down. How much more dystopian <laughs> could it get? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to need to get a hammer from, um, from the Amazon Fulfillment Center because there's just going to be a cloud of hammers around the suburbs and, and one just drops down. Um, so drones themselves, I don't think, are the, the most interesting part of the conversation when we talk about all these different aspects. It's really the way that drones change everything else that becomes interesting. Drones changing the way that we commute to work and the way that we drive, changing what infrastructure looks like, um, changing how um, resources are distributed, distributed around the city. Hospitals no longer become centralized because you have hospitals placed in a network of driverless cars that just migrate and nomadically operate, o occupy a city and kind of based on algorithms that understand where most need would probably be They'll just kind of hover around those areas of the town because they suspect and, and, and probability tells them that something is going to go wrong there. Um, uh, I think these are the, the things we should be prototyping as, as speculators, as, as um, future visionaries right now. And you mentioned in driverless cars, and, and driverless cars throw up similar kind of ethical conundrums, don't they? Like one of the kind of key conundrums for... The, the programmers or the developers who drive those cars is if the car is artificially intelligent and it realizes that it's in a crash situation, is it better to drive into the child at the side of the road or sacrifice the driver under the wheels of a truck? And these are kind of actual problems that the industry is grappling with. Yeah, I mean, we talk, we talk about kind of moral machines um, and there's an MIT research program now that's trying to crowdsource the morals and ethical decision-making process of a driverless car, so you can go online and um, you, you, you kind of fill out this survey. It's almost like a game where you see a car driving and they run through a scenario. Like, here is three school children um, and uh, two uh, adult doctors. You can, you can save one or the other. Which, which do you kill? Um, uh, and they use that data collection process is a way to train uh, an AI um, inside the car operating system. Um, uh, I mean, these are fundamental moral and ethical questions um, uh, that we really, and the conversations we really should be having. But, um, you know, what does it mean 
if we're in a moment where we need to have an ethicist or a philosopher sitting beside uh, a coder or a tech inside um, DJI, the drone drone manufacturer, um, to ask these questions. Because when we think about like how a driverless car reads or understands a person, we're making decisions like how big is a person? Um, like at what point does a person start to become a van? You know, like how fat do you, is the extent of a person versus how skinny they are? Like, like when you start to think about how you code what a person is into the AI of a driverless car, um, just that simple question throws up a huge um, uh, moral and ethical implications. Um, uh, and we should be having those, those discussions uh, in a really open way. Um, but a lot of that is locked behind corporate IP. The greatest problem with all these technologies is that we're not having conversations like this one about them. We have conversations like this after they're already here. The question is how do we start to have those kind of conversations before they arrive um, so we can make more informed decisions about whether we want a future where drones are as ubiquitous as pigeons or not. A lot of people think that, you know when you go onto a website and you have to do that recapture to prove that you're a human and not a robot, and it shows you lots of pictures and it says tick all the ones that are street signs or zebra crossings or whatever. A lot of people think that that's being used to train artificial intelligence for driverless cars. So we're kind of being tricked into giving the kind of visual information that will help these cars be able to navigate without us. Yeah, I mean, uh, there, there's there's a uh, hundred different ways that that you can collect training sets. I mean, basically, an AI is, you know, when we talk about artificial intelligence, it's not intelligent at all. Um, it's just a really dumb set of rules, um, and it's and it's as smart as the training data that we use, um, and that's why. You know, the, those, the, the projects around things like moral machines are really interesting because they're trying to say that actually one of the training sets that really matter here is an ethical one. Um, uh, and, when, you know, another well, one of the latest films that we've done is, is called um, uh, Soul City Machine, which is a film scripted by an AI we trained on um, urban management systems. Um, uh, and there we're exploring what it means that that the same kind of operating systems that are inside a drone or inside a driverless car actually manage entire city networks. Um, and what does it mean to engage with a city um, that's governed not by someone that's publicly elected, um, but by um, an urban operating system owned by Cisco Systems or Microsoft? Um, what is that transaction like? In, in that scenario, are we customers or, or are we citizens of the city? Um, uh, what is the nature of public space? Uh, what does that mean when the systems that manage that public space, again, aren't part of, part of a real system generated by an elected government, but they're part of a real system generated by um, uh, closed proprietary algorithms? Um, we see that happen with Facebook right now. Facebook is a type of public space, um, yet uh, the things I'm allowed to say in that space are decided by a, a guy in hoodie and sneakers, um, uh, accountable to a, to a group of shareholders, um, not accountable to a public that can throw them out of office. Um, it's a fundamental shift in power, and drones are, are one part of that much larger conversation, a very visible part, but not the only part. And you said just now, Doug, you know, if, if the city is, is run by an AI network, are we, did you, I think you said customers, or are we citizens? But we could just be data sets or even slaves, couldn't we? Because Facebook, you know, are we, are we users of Facebook or members of Facebook? Or are we just kind of like data meat that it can, that it can mine and, and, and sell to advertisers? Well, yeah. we are data meat, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're just, uh, or for drones, we're, we're just a, a hot surface upon which its sensors can reflect, um, basically. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole lot of stuff now, um, uh, really interesting work being done around machine vision that... Um, in order, if, if we do imagine the city and the world is going to be filled with driverless cars and drones and all manner of intelligent objects, um, how those objects see changes the way that we start to design our spaces. Um, uh, like, I think it's interesting to think about how we might redesign a building so it's more visible to drones, or how we might redesign ourselves so that we become more visible to drones. Um, we just did it. We did a film called Where the City Can't See. 
which is a film shot entirely using um, LiDAR scanners, um, which are the same technology that driverless cars used to see and navigate the world. And there's now uh, drone-based LiDAR as well. So there's lots of um, drones that also use LiDAR to navigate. Um, and we created a series of costumes for a group of underground ravers that were trying to disappear to the eyes of the city. You know, like in the 90s, if you wanted to have a, an underground party, you would go out to the industrial periphery because there weren't a lot of neighbors. You could turn the music up loud, you could have sex, you could do drugs, because um, no one really was gonna look. But in a city that sees everything, filled with drones, filled with driverless cars that can see in millimeter precision, where do those spaces of exception exist? And the idea was that you could create these kind of um, digital camouflage costumes, this new kind of hoodie that would allow you to disappear in plain sight, um, uh, be invisible to the eyes of the machine. And I think we're gonna start to see that both at the scale of fashion, where fashion evolves based around the latest software update rather than a change in natural season. But then you can imagine the extension of that with architecture, where glass, which is currently being used in terms of think, thinking about transparency of light, we're now gonna be thinking about buildings in terms of how transparent they are to a drone, how visible they are to a drone. We're gonna um, cover our buildings with forms of sort of calibration graffiti um, so that the drones can accurately map facades and they know where buildings are so that just like, um, uh, birds flying, smashing into windows and killing themselves. We don't want the drones doing that either. So we're going to start to redesign our buildings, not for our own sensibilities, our own patterns of vision, but for how drones see and how um, drones collect data and things like that. And I think that's, again, a fundamental shift in what cities are. And what about um, uh, the whole facial recognition scenario, which, which um, is not that long ago that that it became sort of apparent that China was monitoring its citizens and sort of socially scoring them. And, um, you know, if, if, you, if you misbehave, uh, like get a, a speeding ticket it's or... Like, you, a, like a Black Mirror episode, wasn't it? Yeah. It's like a, yeah, a Black Mirror episode with um, 900 million <laughs> <laughs> car textures. Um, no, but it, they've introduced a system of social scoring and part of it is based on um, facial recognition. So if you cross the road when the light is red, that's a, a mark against your social score, and if your social score dips below a certain point, then you may not be able to take long-distance train journeys. You may not even be issued with a passport. And you know, everyone in the West was like, "See, I told you, China's really evil." But um, the US now has the same thing in its airports, and Heathrow's introducing the same thing in within the next two years or so. So, so what was dystopian and scary and 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 over there uh, two years ago is now going to become normal very soon right here yeah, I mean, and without even needing drones to, to do it. Yeah, but I mean, like drones just um, exaggerate and extend those, those possibilities, really. I mean, I think it, it, it speaks to really what is at the heart of, of all of these questions. Like, none of these technologies that we're talking about are solutions to anything. In, in a lot of cases, these technologies arrive not because we need them or because we want them or because they're going to make our lives better, but because they can be sold and we would buy them. Um, and that's not really the way that we should be bringing things into our world. Um, what, what these technologies do, if they're not solving problems, is they just exaggerate the problems that already exist. Um, these, something like a drone is, is equal parts fear and wonder, because so are we. We can use a drone like Norman Foster imagines to, to deliver vaccines to remote communities in Africa. Um, and that's extraordinary. Um, we can also use a drone to peer in through the window of a teenage girl getting dressed, um, and that's horrific. Um, it's the same piece of technology, it just depends on who's behind the control sticks. Um, we can use a drone to um, create a beautiful experience inside the Barbican Theatre, or we can put um, uh, missiles on it and, and drop bombs in a, in a country we never visited before. Um, we, can, we can stick a dildo on it and fly it around the Russian parliament uh, as a protest like someone did recently. Um, uh, it wasn't you, was it? Uh, no, I wish it was. I wish it was. That would have been great for our stick. Um, uh, um, or you can attach a machine gun to it um, and fly it over a music festival and kill a thousand people. Um, uh, 
and that's why you know a film like yours and and hopefully the projects that we do are, are kind of important because they foreground those kind of conversations because they want to be talking about the ways that you know we can imagine drones as new kind of pets and and your daughter can have a, a fluffy little drone that, that that follows her around and if she's walking home from the train station at night on her own it kind of lights the way and um keeps her safe um, it's a sadly neglected <laughs> pet now i can tell you <laughs> <laughs> gathering dust in its box yeah um uh, i want to be able to have conversations about like um, what what a kind of a punk rock drone looks like, or, or what does a goth drone look like? How do we costume them and customize them? Like we customize our cars or our phones, um, but at the same time, if we want those kind of futures, we also have to talk about um, the person using it um, to, to 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 drop bombs on on people in a music festival or to. Um, uh, uh, to, to, to surveil people or um, to remotely operate as part of an extension of the military-industrial complex. You know? Let's try and be a little bit optimistic for, for a few minutes. One, one of the interesting things about drones is that they're, they're things that fly that don't rely on fossil fuels. Um, but also there's, there's now increasing activity in trying to kind of electrify regular planes. And Norway, for example, is trying to um, make sure all of its internal flights are fully electric within 30, 25, 30 years or, or something like that. How, how do drones and that kind of, um, the, 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 the kind of the, the power, the, the, the aviational aspect of it, how does that fit into any kind of hope for saving our environment <laughs> in the future, given that most of the technologies we, we talk about demand more power, they design, demand more raw materials from the earth, I mean, there's a, there's a, it's a two, two edged, double edged sword, isn't it? Like um, electric power, yes, it's zero emissions when it's flying around, but it relies on lithium that's mined in the Andes or whatever and vast amounts of power to produce the, the stuff in the first place. Yeah, you're going you're to be hard pressed drawing me out on optimism around drones, but um, uh, yeah, maybe. I mean, I think, um, I mean, yes, they're, they're electric. Um, but yes, we need to then talk about where our electricity comes from. And again, that's the thing about drones. They're, they're just one part of a planetary scaled network, a very visible part and a part that you know, makes great conversation and, 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 and plays well in a documentary. But um, we need to understand drones as not singular objects, but as, um, as enmeshed into this planetary scaled condition. So if we want to talk about the environmental consequences of drones, then we need to think about where the energy that powers them comes from. We need to talk about where the lithium, that the batteries that, that are light enough that enable them to fly comes from. Um, and then we need to talk about the, the things that they should be superseding. At the moment, drones aren't necessarily replacing systems. They're kind of adding a new layer of systems on top. Um, I don't think we need drones to do the things that they're doing. Um, uh, maybe there's a way of identifying new opportunities um, and new efficiencies that drones can create. Um, uh, but at the moment, the, the kind of hopeful futures that we see playing out are located around the idea of like transport of, of single people inside a drone and these bespoke little limousines that are going to take you places. The last thing we need is more single person um, transport systems. But you started off that answer by saying, I'd be hard pressed to get you to be optimistic about drones. Do you essentially see that it as a kind of, in a pessimistic way then this, um, drones in particular or all of technology, Liam? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think, um, I guess, I guess it's, it's more about like, uh, we're really good at talking about the promise of technology. Um, and, that's, and they're the dominant narratives that surround it. And that's primarily, primarily because most of the tech, the tech that comes at us is, is trying to be sold to us. You know, we're not, um, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're talked of as users, but really we're, we're customers. Um, uh, and I guess it's important uh, with the work that we make, what we're trying to do is provide some counter-narratives to that, to that kind of over, overly saccharine um, uh, um, marketing view of, of tech. And just to say that actually it's more complicated. So I guess my position isn't pessimistic at all, it's just to say it's complicated, because we're complicated. Um, and I think we need to just embrace 
the wondrous things that these can do as well as understanding their potential misuse. Because um, ultimately we're going to come out somewhere in between the two and we need to mitigate against the possible um, uh, disastrous implications and optimize for the possible good inf and, and preferable implications. And that's why I think these sort of speculative projects and predicting and, and throwing ideas about the future around is really valuable because we're at a point where the future needs to be a project again um, because these technologies come so much faster than our cultural capacity to understand what they mean. They're, they're sort of what I describe as before culture technologies. Um, so what can we do to prototype our cultural responses to these things before they come? And that's why we make the films that we do. Um, that's why I love science fiction, because you get to see um, uh, uh, the way that these things might play out. Um, and that might inform the decisions we make today. It's not about, again, like I said, it's not about getting a prediction right. It's about changing our action right here in the moment. Um, and that's why I think you know all of these conversations, whether it's optimistic or pessimistic, are, are useful. They can't exist independent of each other. So, what's your next speculative project, and does it have anything to do with drones? Um, I think, I th like, to really to really speculate. Um, you have to understand that drones are going to be some part of our future. Um, uh, so the next project we're doing is a is a is a piece called Planet City, um, uh, which is a city for the entire population of the Earth. Um, uh, basically, if you uh, there's a there's an on idea. Earth or somewhere else on Earth on Earth right. on Earth. So there's a there's a there's a um, a theory put forward called Half Earth, which suggests that. Um, one way of moving forward is to concentrate all of human development into half the planet and let the other half um, become uh, return to nature. Um, but if you look at some of the densest urban constructions that we've made as a culture, um, Manila currently is the densest city on Earth. If you housed all seven and a half billion people that live on the planet in a city, the density of Manila, it would be about the size of a single US state. Uh, meaning the entire rest of the planet could be given back to a real rewilded nature. Um, uh, we're intrigued by what that city looks like. You know, a city so big it doesn't have a Chinatown, it has China. Uh, it doesn't have little Italy, it has Italy itself. Um, what does that city look like? And to try and earnestly design that city in the most real way possible. Um, and that means it's going to be filled with drones, it's going to be filled with vertical farms, like... All the tech that we talk about right now, we're interested in using this city as a bit of a placeholder to play out its possible futures. So it's not just a fantasy, but it will be, it's a project that we're working with a whole range of scientists and technologists to develop and, and prototype. I think that's a really interesting uh, phenomenon. Actually, one of the things that we've been talking about doing at Design for a long time but haven't got around to is like a competition to redesign the Earth. Like, okay, um, if, if things carry on as they are, we're going to destroy the planet. Um, but also the idea of going back and sort of taking away the, all of the stuff that we've got used to sounds impossible as well. So maybe we just re need to redesign it all. So there would be a, like a food production zone and a and a, um, a, a, a wildlife park and uh, you know fractal coastlines are a bit inefficient. So maybe they could be rationalised a bit. Sounds like you, you've already done it, though, Liam. We're already working on the solution. Well, yeah, it's a suitably modest proposal, I guess. I mean, actually, that reminds me that one of the, the starting points for this project was Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal, where he was talking about... I can't remember. We're not going to get it right, but he was talking about... Um, he wrote this really detailed paper, um, super research, really informed about how the rich should eat the, the children of the poor as a way of um, relieving congestion in Victorian London. I'm, I'm sure I'm butchering this, 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 this analogy, but um, I, I'm interested in that type of um, consequence-free speculation, just that, that mad proposal that, that sounds totally ridiculous, preposterous, and horrific. Um, uh, but somehow, it, it, its role is not being a clear proposal, but its role is in raising that question in the first place um, and getting us to start talking about it um, and, prov and getting us to start moving closer to different kinds of um, solutions. And that's why I think um, these type of projects are interesting. That's why we started working with drones when we did. We did a panel discussion at Dutch Design Week last year and it was about uh, design and the Anthropocene era. If, if you, you know, um, scientists are starting to think we're in a new era where human activity is shaping the Earth more than any kind of geological or, 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 or solar 
activity and, and how can designers respond to that? And my favorite quote from the discussion was this young designer who said, we need more science fiction. We need to put these ideas on the table that are crazy about um, uh, terraforming or about um, uh, geoengineering or you know like blocking out the sun with 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 big umbrellas in the sky or creating new land masses and, and so on and so forth so I guess to bring this this talk to a conclusion that's kind of the game that you're in whether it's by terrifying the people out of their skins or by putting forward utopian proposals it's about using design uh, using creativity to put scenarios on the table that then people can engage with yeah, I mean, it, uh, we, we talk about them as kind of productive dystopias, I suppose, that you put um, something out there as kind of a cautionary tale. But, you know, if the future is, is this uh, unknown uh, uh, clouded landscape, um, then each of these little speculations is like shining a torchlight into that landscape. And the more torchlight we shine, the more we kind of get a clearer picture of what's in front of us, then we can kind of navigate a path through it. In, in, a, in a much more productive and strategic way as opposed to, as, as opposed to blindly stumbling into it. Um, you know, I, I can't remember who said it, but the, the, this idea that the future is a verb, not a noun. It's not something that just happens. It doesn't just rush over us like water. It's something each of us actively have a part in shaping and defining. Um, uh, where do we find agency to do that? Um, uh, and... Um, how do we use these kind of forms of speculation um, to help us to be more informed when they're making those de when we're making those decisions? Um, and I think that's part of uh, you know uh, part of our interest in, in in making the work that we do. Well, I think it's optimistic that you're even thinking we might still be here in 30 years time. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, thank you very much, Liam. Thank you very much Thanks, to the, the building centre, and thank you very much to the audience.